The Vampire by Jan Neruda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Rhys Thomas. The Vampire by Jan Neruda. The excursion steamer brought us from Constantinople to the shore of the island of Principo, and we disembarked. The number of passengers was not large. There was one Polish family, a father, a mother, a daughter, and her bridegroom, and then we two. Oh yes, I must not forget that when we were already on the wooden bridge which crosses the Golden Horn to Constantinople, a Greek, a rather youthful man, joined us. He was probably an artist, judging by the portfolio he carried under his arm. Long black locks floated to his shoulders, his face was pale, and his black eyes were deeply set in their sockets. From the first moment he interested me, especially for his obligingness and for his knowledge of local conditions, but he talked too much, and I then turned away from him. All the more agreeable was the Polish family. The father and mother were good-natured, fine people, the lover a handsome young fellow of direct and refined manners. They had come to Prinkipo to spend the summer months for the sake of the daughter, who was slightly ailing. The beautiful pale girl was either just recovering from a severe illness, or else a serious disease was just fastening its hold upon her. She leaned upon her lover when she walked, and very often sat down to rest, while a frequent dry little cough interrupted her whispers. Whenever she coughed, her escort would considerately pause in their walk. He always cast upon her a glance of sympathetic suffering, and she would look back at him as if she would say, It is nothing. I am happy. They believed in health and happiness. On the recommendation of the Greek, who departed from us immediately at the pier, the family secured quarters in the hotel on the hill. The hotel keeper was a Frenchman, and his entire building was equipped comfortably and artistically according to the French style. We breakfasted together, and when the noon heat had abated somewhat, we all betook ourselves to the heights, where in the grove of Siberian stone pines we could refresh ourselves with the view. Hardly had we found a suitable spot and settled ourselves when the Greek appeared again. He greeted us lightly, looked about and seated himself only a few steps from us. He opened his portfolio and began to sketch. I think he purposely sits with his back to the rock so that we can't look at his sketch, I said. We don't have to said the young Paul. We have enough before us to look at. After a while, he added, it seems to me he's sketching us in a sort of background. Well, let him. We truly did have enough to gaze at. There is not a more beautiful or more happy corner in the world than that very Principo. The political martyr Irene, contemporary of Charles the Great, lived there for a month as an exile. If I could live a month of my life there, I would be happy for the memory of it for the rest of my days. I shall never forget even that one day spent at Principo. The air was as clear as a diamond, so soft, so caressing, that one's whole soul swung out upon it into the distance. At the right beyond the sea projected the brown Asiatic summits. To the left in the distance purpled the steep coasts of Europe. The neighboring Chalki, one of the nine islands of the Prince's archipelago, rose with its cypress forests into the peaceful heights like a sorrowful dream, crowned by a great structure, an asylum for those whose minds are sick. The sea of Marmara was but slightly ruffled and played in all colours like a sparkling opal. In the distance the sea was as white as milk, then rosy, between the two islands a glowing orange, and below us it was beautifully greenish-blue, like a transparent sapphire. It was resplendent in its own beauty. Nowhere were there any large ships. Only two small craft flying the English flag sped along the shore. One was a steamboat as big as a watchman's booth. The second had about twelve oarsmen. And when the oars rose simultaneously, molten silver dripped from them. Trustful dolphins darted in and out among them and dove with long, arching flights above the surface of the water. Through the blue heavens now and then, calm eagles winged their way, measuring the space between two continents. The entire slope below us was covered with blossoming roses whose fragrance filled the air. From the coffee house near the sea, music was carried up to us through the clear air, hushed somewhat by the distance. The effect was enchanting. We all sat silent and steeped our souls completely in the picture of paradise. The young Polish girl lay on the grass with her head supported on the bosom of her lover. The pale oval of her delicate face was slightly tinged with soft color, and from her blue eyes tears suddenly gushed forth. The lover understood, bent down and kissed tear after tear. Her mother was also moved to tears, and I, even I, felt a strange twinge. Here, mind and body, both must get well, whispered the girl. How happy a land this is. 
God knows I haven't any enemies. But if I had, I would forgive them here, said the father in a trembling voice. And again we became silent. We were all in such a wonderful mood, so unspeakably sweet it all was. Each felt for himself a world of happiness, and each one would have shared his happiness with the whole world. All felt the same, and so no one disturbed another. We had scarcely even noticed the Greek. After an hour or so had arisen, folded his portfolio, and with a slight nod had taken his departure. We remained. Finally, after several hours, when the distance was becoming overspread with a darker violet, so magically beautiful in the south, the mother reminded us it was time to depart. We arose and walked down toward the hotel with the easy elastic steps that characterize carefree children. We sat down in the hotel under the handsome veranda. Hardly had we been seated when we heard below the sounds of quarrelling and oaths. Our Greek was wrangling with the hotel keeper, and for the entertainment of it we listened. The amusement did not last long. If I didn't have other guests, growled the hotel keeper, and ascended the steps towards us. I beg you to tell me, sir, asked the young Pole of the approaching hotel keeper, who is that gentleman? What's his name? Eh, who knows what that fellow's name is, grumbled the hotel keeper, and he gazed venomously downwards. We call him the vampire. An artist? Fine trade. He sketches only corpses. Just as soon as someone in Constantinople or here in the neighborhood dies, that very day he has a picture of the dead one completed. That fellow paints them beforehand, and he never makes a mistake, just like a vulture. The old Polish woman shrieked affrightedly. In her arms lay her daughter, pale as chalk. She had fainted. In one bound the lover had leaped down the steps. With one hand he seized the Greek, and with the other reached for the portfolio. We ran down after him. Both men were rolling in the sand. The contents of the portfolio were scattered all about. On one sheet, sketched with a crayon, was the head of the young Polish girl, her eyes closed, and a wreath of myrtle on her brow. End of The Vampire by Jan Neruda Recording by David Rees-Thomas at www.davidreesthomas.com